Hey, and welcome to The Residence, a series of four podcasts exploring community in the creative sector, specifically focusing on the Pervasive Media Studio, a brilliant community of over 160 artists, creative companies, technologists, and academics, all exploring experience design and creative tech in and around Bristol. The Pervasive Media Studio is a collaboration between The Watershed, University of Bristol, and UE Bristol. We've all kindly decided to support this podcast, so shouts to them. For this series, we invited residents who you might consider to be people of difference to chat with us on Zoom about how they were coping with lockdown. But we've also thrown some moral dilemmas or quandaries their way, if you will, so stay tuned. In this episode, we're joined by some residents who identify as queer. We pretty much hashed it all out, but some of the key themes were hope and the liberation that comes with celebrating difference. But that's enough from me. I'll let you hear it from them. Hey guys, Will Taylor here. Uh, and I'm joined by Rosie Pobright, Tom Marshman, Alex Stevens, and Jazz Cruson, all residents in a PM studio. Uh, and to be honest with you, man, the pleasure's all mine, for real, for real. I've like worked with you guys and spoken with you guys quite a few times over the last couple of years, and I've just got nothing but love for you guys. So thank you so much for joining us in this podcast. Um, I think it's about that time that you guys introduced yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Alex Stevens. I am a visual artist that specializes in sculpture. I make things out of wood. Um, and what I make is usually based on me going to a particular place. So that could be a museum or a national trust house or something quite somewhere quite historic. And then I make a response to a story that I hear there. So sculptures that unlock stories in places and the stories that I find in those places are quite unusual. The things that people aren't talking about, mostly. Uh, I'm also part of a two-part team called Polari Press with another artist called Joe Kimber, who's also based in the studio. Um, that practice. I've heard of her. Yes. Uh, she, um, we together um, make a series of zines and books that look into queer history. Love it. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Tom. Hi, Will. Um, so I'm Tom and I'm um, in the studio and I'm a um, theatre maker and performer. Um, a lot of my work involves um, LGBT uh Q plus stories, often stories that feel like they're not like that present within an archive. So my process is often like collaborating sometimes with historians to try and uncover those stories and then try and find the most engaging ways to tell those stories. And I use like all sorts of different devices. So sometimes I use creative technology projections. Sometimes I use poems and song and kind of more things that are often associated with kind of queer cabaret stuff. Thank you, Tom. Um, next up, we have Rosie. Hi, Will. Nice to see you. I'm Rosie and I would call myself a digital artist and story maker. I'm also researching a PhD at the moment. Um, and I make story experiences. So I make stories that put the audience at the center of the action and give them um, the ability to um, affect what happens. The PhD that I'm working on at the moment that I'm a couple of years into is looking at the embodied story. And that is stories that are uh, designed, story experiences that are designed with the, um, the body of the audience in mind. Um, and so I'm kind of looking at the different things that should be considered in, in creating an embodied story um, in in a good way and um, creating some design principles around that. And, the, and then my kind of artist work is often themed around trying to get people to understand different perspectives and difference. And so the kind of this, the, the looking at our own experiences within our own bodies and then this thing around understanding difference or understanding different perspectives has sort of come together to this kind of um, focus on um, looking at uh, how the bodies we inhabit affect everything, the way in which we experience the world. That's kind of where my brain is at the moment. Ah, that's cool. Deep in thought. It's because it's because I did a PhD exam yesterday, and so I'm really thinking about it. I'm not. I don't normally go go off on one like that. Sorry. <laughs> 
And, and then we have... That, that isn't true. You do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and then last but by no means least, we have Jazz. All right, guys. Nice to see you all. Um, yeah, so I'm basically a visual artist and a chef. And I combine the two to create interesting food events, which generally allow people to talk about their stories with food. I think every time we say stories, we have to pay 50p. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, do you know what, man? It's so great to see you guys. Like, I, I've like, worked with you guys on a few things and I've, I've been like fortunate enough to experience some of the projects that you guys have been working on over the last few years as well. Um, and it's so peculiar doing like this... I'd just love to be in the same room as you guys right now. I think I think that's the one thing that's getting me the most right now. Like, it'd be so great just to feel like your energies viscerally. But we make do, innit? Well, there's currently a vacancy in my bubble. Nobody's asked me to be in their bubble yet. Soon come, soon come. Do you reckon that you can put ads out for that somewhere? Kind <laughs> <laughs> of grinder. <laughs> So, I mean, like, speaking directly to that, actually, um, I know that life for me has been incredibly peculiar during lockdown. I felt I felt a bit stifled because my lifestyle didn't actually have to change. Like, I was very strict with how, I, how many times I went to a supermarket to buy food. Generally a germaphobe, so I always have hand sanitizer and a packet of tissues with me. Don't usually wear face masks, but I'm known to wear pashminas and scarves and cover my face with them. So it was a bit like, Oh my god, the only thing I can't do is go outside now, which was a bummer. Um, so I was just wondering, like, how, how lockdown has been for you guys? I've been thinking about this. I guess my kind of headline response is um, I've, I've come into my queerness late in life, right? So I feel like I've only just come out and then I got told to go back in again. I was over in uh, Boston when the, pandem- when the pandemic hit and um, I was having a really lovely time, like turning up in this new city and just like going to all the queer events and like meeting people through tinder and like dating and like that was like a really nice moment for me because i think in in bristol i sort of it was kind of over the course of probably a couple of years i sort of very gradually sort of came out and like got to the spot that i'm in now so whereas turning up in boston as a queer person and being seen that way by all of the new people that i met like it just felt really lovely and then coming back to Bristol, coming back to Bristol, going into my house and not really seeing anyone. And then there's also like, I've been in a non-monogamous relationship. Um, and we moved in together and um, that was never the plan, but we decided we didn't want to be lonely. So we moved in together um, and that was like really great. And then all of the things that we discussed around the, um, the edges of the relationship and like where it would go, um, and uh, kind of went out the window in my brain and I got really, I started to get really serious and kind of be thinking about the future and stuff and that didn't really suit her. The pandemic squished a kind of nice airy thing that was working quite well into something that then didn't work and kind of resulted in its end. Sad, I didn't know that was happening for you, Rosie. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky though, isn't it? Because you can't... The thing is with your... Ex- your um experience there rosie is corona has cornered us into facing ourselves and facing what we want uh, similarly to you i've not not with my sexuality but um with my mental health it's um cornered me into a situation where i thought i was doing well um and now i'm having to face things that particularly weren't you know we're 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 busy people, we're distracted by often our creative um, pursuits and our our lifestyles and Corona has just made us pause and made us uh, over reflect on who we are, what we do (laughs) and it's almost like, yeah, it's almost like it's put a massive mirror up and gone, it's just you. So I think I can understand why perhaps a, you know, a breezy casual relationship has had so much pressure put on it where, you know, it wouldn't normally have happened. 
there's there's something you guys are speaking to like in in like through this topic that I've definitely experienced as well and it rings quite true to me you know stuff about like like you guys have mentioned having the mirror put up and and being forced to kind of like sit with oneself um like one of the things that I've really recognized I'm always on the front foot with telling people how grateful I am for them whilst I've seen a lot of people taking like what they're going through and like adapt and I know that in in other spaces there are people who are like really really struggling my heart goes out a bit to the youth who are perhaps not out I think if you if you were sitting with that mirror it would be at the surface and if you didn't have such an accepting family or you yourself wasn't to terms with it I think um you would be struggling right now with that I just feel sorry for just anyone that's young that just they because young people just need to see their own story reflected back at them they yeah. can't they can't just see themselves they need to be like and so I'm old enough and ugly enough to know myself really well and that's why I've managed to survive quite happily you know but um I couldn't have done it 20 years ago 30 years no. ago no, I, I don't think I could, especially if I was still living at home with homophobic parents, whatever. You know, it'd be it'd be awful. But then there is, I guess, the argument that, um, and I think that's much true for younger people, is that they are much more adept in socialising online, so it doesn't feel as an alien thing. And I yeah. think the great thing about socialising online actually has prove what has proved to be the case is that those people that are sort of generally like they don't put themselves forward because they kind of are shy kind of retiring types maybe have anxiety actually a lot of well some of them I'm just generalizing now can put themselves forward in a way that they couldn't in in real life and that's been really positive yeah man the internet didn't really exist 20 years ago, we were, I was literally yeah. writing letters to my friends on paper and putting stamps on envelopes. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a different place. Part, really? part of my journey about coming out is that I went out and I m met people and made a lot of mistakes about what I wanted or what I thought I wanted. And if you're in that environment where you can't even express yourself freely mm. to those that environment of like homophobic parents or people that abuse you or whatever, you just can't escape. Like you can't have the experiences that build you. It's so interesting to listen to you guys talk about this stuff like firsthand. Um, because like, as I've, as I've gotten older, I've kind of like accumulated more queer friends and I've, as I've grown and, and learned so much more and tried to like fight those, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, prejudices quite literally that I grew up with um what I've come to really admire about the queer like experience is the sense of community I always get this element of like celebration and support well in the studio we often form a queer corner don't we yeah we do, we do don't we <laughs> I'm always sat next to Tom but it's kind of through default <laughs> but you like you can always expect there to be some sort of joke like something celebratory once again you know what I mean and naturally like I I kind of draw a lot of parallels between the like queer experience and the ethnic minority experience and that like your immediate community are so important you know and, and and as more information came through about COVID and how it affects ethnic minorities so on and so forth I found myself really checking in on my friends um, and then I realized how natural that felt for me so I was, I was kind of like wondering, did you feel like more of a sense of understanding and trust in your community as lockdown was going in? I don't think any, any human on earth was prepared for a pandemic. And I don't think in history they ever were, you know, it's just the way a pandemic is. It kind of just swoops, hits and then leaves. And, but I think the, the, the point is, is um, we will see the strength in our community um, probably after. Well, were you were you slightly referencing like the AIDS epidemic and how there is some comparisons there? Yeah, yeah. I think I was I was like trying to speak to that somewhat. You know, like 
because I, I I suppose I learned a lot about it in the last year watching documentaries like Paris is Burning and then a program called Pose. Like I didn't actually realize the extent to which the queer community was discriminated against. If if anything, learning more about that kind of like liberated me more. I felt an incredible sense of empathy towards the queer experience. Um, so that's that's kind of like why I was, yeah, kind of like speaking to it. I've, I've been involved in that conversation many times and it just feels a bit like it doesn't feel helpful because I think like something about AIDS and HIV, like society blamed people and that isn't, there isn't really a sense of blame with um, COVID. I don't know, actually, having said that, whether there's some, whether, whether Chinese people feel, feel difficult about leaving the house in a different way, but I'm, it's not attached to a community in that way. Yeah, it was kind of framed as a, this is God's punishment for mm. um, gayness, wasn't it? That, that, that this is God getting his revenge. And it's about, yeah, it was about us having loose morals. I just find that stuff so, how people can frame stuff like that so weird. Man, you start these conversations and you have no idea where they're going to go. Lockdown has clearly affected our residents in a variety of ways. You're listening to The Residents, a mini series of conversations recorded in lockdown with residents from the PM studio. Next up, Joe and I have prepared a few questions to see how our residents would respond to 2020 kept Fred more lemons day away. So come through. Um, so we're about to get into the second part of our of our little conversation and we've got a little game for you guys to play. We've got a series of one, two, three, four, five categories. You'll all have a chance to pick one and then we'll give you like a a little scenario in each category for you to respond to. So I suppose I'm going to start off with Alec, if you'd like to choose a category. Uh, economy. Money, the money, money, money. Money, 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 money. All right, so Alec, for you, first question is, you get to decide where your taxes are spent by the government. Do you think it's a good idea? And where's the first place you'd want that money spent? Do I think it's if it's a good idea? So are we saying that everyone decides individually or just me? I'm like an almighty person spending taxes let's go everyone decides individually okay i think that would be terrible (laughs) yeah because i would personally just um put cycle lanes everywhere because i'm a cyclist um but that means that it's set up just for my view of the world whereas we live in a community of people with lots of different needs Sounds great because then I'll be getting what I want. I can't complain, but I feel there needs to. But you always get what you want anyway. Eventually, don't you, Alex? Well, that's what I think, but (laughs) but maybe that's not the case. Um, Yeah, so I think it would be a terrible idea. I think a unanimous decision. I think that there needs to be a a group. That's Mm. what we have at the minute, isn't it? Um, If I was an almighty tax spender. Everyone would live in my vision, and I don't want that either. Could, uh, you know, collaborate and then make the decisions and maybe spend some on the NHS? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit, I forgot about the NHS. (laughs) Could what about the four? If the four of us were in charge, could we make a like queer council of Great Britain and just like take charge of everything? Because I'd be very happy to be in charge. You could just put me in charge, and I'd sort everything out. Yeah, it's whether we'd vote for you, Rosie. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be in charge, and I don't want Alex to be either. <laughs> Like, part of my personality is that I don't like being in that position. But the, that's why you should be in the position. Those are the sorts of people oh. who should be in power, are the ones that don't want it. People like me should be kept the hell away because I love power. I just, yeah, I'd be terrible. I can definitely, like, relate to that kind of, like, tension of, uh, like, if it's just my idea, then it, it won't fit everyone, but... Knowing you, Alec, I reckon your idea takes a lot of people into consideration. You'd have a team helping you. Yeah, and Ro- Rosie would make sure she's on that team, right? Yeah, hopefully I would be selfless in that way, but like 
with power comes corruption, doesn't it? That they've shown that it actually changes the pathways in your brain when you have power. You become more selfish and more self-obsessed. Um, they put students uh, at intersections of crossroads where there were zebra crossings, um, and they measured who uh, driving cars stopped and who didn't for people who were on the crossing. And there was a direct relationship with the value of your car and the amount of times that you stopped. If, you, if you've got a more expensive bike... Are you going to stop more? Good question. <laughs> oh, sweet. So I suppose we're going to move on to Tom. Can I choose arts, please? The question we've got here is, for the foreseeable future, only one industry is allowed to have controlled mass gatherings, film or music. Which one would you pick? Music, I think. Because, like, you could, it's about sharing it with other people. Film, I don't think you get that so much. Like, if you go to a gig on your own, there's elements of it that can be quite nice. Yeah. But I'm coming from a place, I don't really go to music gigs. I probably go to music gigs about three times a year. I've watched a lot of films recently, and I haven't been to any music parties. I think we've had enough of films. We want a music party. Part of me was thinking that, it, like lockdown would actually like reinvigorate an, a literal underground scene well as lgbtq people you know we know a lot about that knocking on doorways and special knocks and going into s- cellars and hidden spaces i remember yeah. as, a, as a as um a teen and the local gay bar was just always it, it was like visualized in every kid's mind as being a, a sin so it was like oh my god are you going in oh my god I'm, oh my god i'm going in <laughs> it's like wow i just it, when it, you were saying that i just got that feeling <laughs> yeah right who did that happen to when they first went to a gay bar was it just like oh my god what am i doing i'm gonna get seen and then you get inside and it's the most uplifting kind of wonderful like oh fuck this is allowed kind of moment until you reach the bar and some dyke stares at you and it's like oh my god this is awkward (laughs) kill me now (laughs) and once you're blind drunk then it's fine it's fabulous you become that dyke i can't wait to go to a gay bar again I'm going to hit Queen Schilling up real hard. (laughs) You know, give me those coloured lights and awful Kylie Minogue soundtracks. Kylie Minogue is my G, by the way. She is my G. Really? Not even fucking about. Yeah, yeah. 100%. All right, sweet. So I suppose next up we have got, we've got jazz. I'm going to go for social so for social, we have got, you are now able to access information on potential partners. Internet services now provide full browser history on users. It also means they can potentially access your history. Would you check it? Well, that'd be a bit awkward, but my wife already knows, so it's fine. <laughs> Should we just do it? Like, I'm not really, I looked up what a hummingbird moth looked like. You know, they're pretty amazing. Will looks like he's going to be sick. (laughs) It's so much disgust. Look at it. It's beautiful. Can you see it? I mean, as as long as it stays on your screen. It looks like a bird, but it's actually a little bee. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just like, really, what do you need people to know about you? Or what what are you seeking? Like, secrets? Like, let everyone have their privacy because not everyone is as open so mm. i'm i'm not i'm not for that it kind of takes away the mystery the nice thing about meeting new people is that there's just like millions of ways for them to surprise you mm. you know and 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 i love that i love that process of getting to know people it's just like oh my god that this cat's hella interesting or this cat's hella boring either way i yeah. learned something you know like the last like big thing I've been searching was um a- actually on on Thursday I did a whole series of searches on how to get a small bird out of your house because I had a little wren trapped in my front room. There was there was a real opportunity to make a friend there, but he didn't. He, he wasn't into it. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, Rosie, 
what category would you like? Uh, so what's left? Tech and health is left, is I it? I mean, you can you can still pick from any of them. Well, no, I'll do different. I'll do tech. Bring me, bring me tech, yeah. You've got a little smile on your face and it worries me. <laughs> <laughs> you can now get a micro trip, microchip installed in your brain that will give you the perfect memory, recording every interaction, every minute of your day. Would you do it? Uh, I want a micro yeah. trip. <laughs> I wish it was a micro trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take both. I'll take the micro trip and I'll take the micro chip for memory as well, please. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. I've got a terrible memory. I th- it's a dyspraxic thing, I think. Yeah, I would love to know everything. There's some people in the world, there's not many, but um, there's a particular condition you can get where you do remember every like people who just don't forget stuff and they can remember what happened seven years ago on a particular date at a particular time now now i'm thinking about it i'm remembering the podcast i got it from and like it means that they can get trapped in certain memories and it can be very difficult like if they lose someone or if a relationship ends or so actually maybe that would be terrible okay no no thanks i'll take the micro trip though yeah please one of my friends he's got an incredible memory um and he can remember things from nights out that we've been on where he was definitely a lot more inebriated than I was. But he remembers so much about what happened on those nights. And I'm so fortunate to have him. That's that's one of the really important things about friendships, isn't it? Particularly ones that last over a number of years is that you've got a shared memory between you. Different pieces that you can then reassemble at different times when you're recalling stuff. It's lovely. Mm. We want. I want to do another round. So... Tom, what category would you like? I'll have um, health, please. Okay. People now have to complete a full sexual health check before engaging in any kind of intimate relationship with anyone. If you don't adhere to this new law and get caught, you'll receive a massive fine. Do you take the risk? No, I think I'll do the checkup. Well, I need to know more detail. Is it a checkup that you can do from home? Yes. All right then, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sign up. But do, what do I have to do then? Show my certificate every time I want to have sex? Yeah, I, I suppose pretty much you have like a got a little, little app on your phone. Last partner, latest checkup. I'd like to have, this is this different thought, but it would be quite good to get some feedback from sexual partners. <laughs> <laughs> a type form. <laughs> Yeah. That's actually so funny. I love that. <laughs> I think it'd be a good idea because you could like go, oh, okay, so that bit was good, but maybe I need to improve on that. You might end up devastated, Tom. I don't think I will because there's a lot of uh, repeat um, clients. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm obviously doing something right. Well, part of having multiple partners is that you that's part of the conversation isn't it like i have it quite openly with my partners like when did you have your last check yeah it kind of happens already but not in such an organized way i don't know maybe maybe it's an age thing or an experience thing as well but a lot of people that i know struggle to have that kind of conversation it's a queer Mm. thing it's 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 it's, 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 they're, they're they're like truth to that it's like a much easier conversation to have in the queer community than think so yeah from my perspective it's like really encouraging to hear because conversations like that need to be normalized i didn't realize the importance of like genuine consent you know and and how opening an opportunity for like consensual conversations to occur that so much hinges on that but so little is actually vocalized I, th- I think it's a queer thing as well, like, like in, in the sense of just as someone who, like, has, has done a lot of both, um, not bragging or anything, but, you know, <laughs> but, like, certainly in the sort of the, the heterosexual situations I've been in, like, the talking about anything to do with what's going on in terms of sex is, like, fucking minimal. It's, re- it's, it's insanely minimal. Whereas the, 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 the queer sex I've had is, like, there's a lot of articulation about what's going on, about what people like. There's a lot of checking in about consent, like, multiple times. Um, and it's kind of great. Like I think uh, it would be a lot of that pressure of masculinity where the male dominance is at the forefront of hetero society and, like, you know, to even talking about women's pleasure it's becoming a new conversation even now i mean god how many centuries has it been there's a long way to go again maybe why we're saying it's a queer thing is because we've had to address our sexuality far harder than our straight peers and you don't and that you're not um literally embodying 
like the, the 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 power dynamics of society as well when you're in a queer coupling H- however much you live by trying not to support patriarchy or whatever like a man and a woman there's just this kind of unspoken condition stu- bullshit basically that's there and and it kind of goes out the window um with queer sex i think which is really cool i mean i think as a society we're just bound up in it really and it it can get to a point where it can be quite exhausting. I'm yeah. I'm just very playful with my own gender, but I identify as, as male. And in lockdown, I'm becoming more aware of the fact that I like to dress up and that dressing up is part of me. Well, what I really want to know is like <laughs> all of these little babies that are growing, that are being brought up as gender neutral what are they going to be like as adults walking around in the world like it's kind of like really exciting it, it probably depends a lot on like the the, the the way we tackle the systems that we're in now there are a lot of people who really feel like gender is a binary and they're not happy about anyone messing with that they can make it very difficult for people who don't particularly identify one way or the other or if you know like i like i, I identify as female but i think i'm quite gender queer and i and i certainly spent a lot of my adulthood trying to wear dresses and I felt like I was wearing drag and I didn't like it like I can be a masculine woman if I want and that's fine but 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 it means people shout at me in the street a lot of people don't like that I think it's exciting the idea of like gender neutrality or at least not even really talking about it until people are a bit older and you know it's all complete nonsense anyway it was really interesting actually I was at a really queer party and it, it wasn't queer as such there was lots of straight people there I was just sat there putting on some finishing touches of glitter, and uh, this this guy came over and was like, "Can I, can you can you do my face?" I was like, yeah, sure. He was like, "Cause I feel really straight, like I shouldn't be here." And it was like, "Everyone can be here." It was almost yeah. like it was spun on the other o- other foot, and it, I found yeah. that quite interesting. Where it was suddenly the emasculated man felt insecure. Um, projecting who he was. It, it's a really weird situation where they force the point about the fact that they don't belong. Yeah, and but the thing was, as soon as he got the glitter on his face, this guy, he thanked me and he felt like he could set free and he went to the front of the stay, um, you know, and partied his ass off. It was almost as if that bit of glitter I gave him gave him the access to be open, mm. to be free. Perhaps straight masculinity is trapped as well. I think this is the thing I'm trying to articulate is that systems that oppress particular groups oppress everybody as like in different ways, right? It's almost like the groups that are within the power need to understand that they are suffering too from it, even if they haven't comprehended it yet. It's been going on for years. This just feels like there's an abuse. You'd go to the gays for a good time and then you leave. Like it, it's just troubling. Perhaps those spaces like women get harassed and they just want and not mm. free from, you know, that kind of male gaze. They're escaping their own oppression. But exactly. like, but then it kind of messes up the space for the gay bar. I, I don't think that it does in a way. I think, you know, the more ingredients you put in a pot, hopefully the tastier it is. It's let's have more diversity in everywhere we go. The thing is, it's 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 better than it was, but it's still fucking yeah. shit. We're still functioning in these systems where if you are of a certain sexual orientation or from a certain heritage you're going to get treated in a certain way in certain places yeah. and it, and that's shit it's some big changes have made like it's it's illegal to be like homophobic in terms of employing people or racist in terms of it's illegal it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in subtle and micro ways so we've kind of we've cracked like the shell of it but we haven't been able to sort of actually get down and get into the reality of people interacting with each other with their pre-baked prejudice with their with their unconscious bias with all of that stuff that people aren't even aware of when it doesn't bother them when they're not oppressed by those things they just don't even know about it right you know hence this big awakening of white people in the UK about racism and they're all kind of like oh my god racism is a thing and that's the thing I think is is people are just it's like now it's time to go deeper right it's time to get we've got we've got laws and stuff but we've still got institutional uh, oppressions of various groups of people we need to go deeper in that and we all need to do it together as well the different communities need to work together and be um, in solidarity with each other as well because 
this is how you know this is how we make the world a better place and it's going to benefit mr um cis straight white man as well as it's going to benefit the rest of us honestly you have no idea how difficult it was to cut that down to 30 minutes or so we touched on so much from a periodic table of intimacies and a lot down to straight fragility I want to thank our guests once again, Tom Marshman, Rosie Pobright, Alex Stevens, and Jazz Cruson for rolling through and chopping it up with us. The Residence was produced, devised, and written by Joe Kimbar and myself, Will Taylor, who was also your host. And shouts to Javier Velastin for the music as well. And big, big, big love to our listeners. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Just type in Pervasive Media Studio and we should come up straight away. And tell your friends to rate us highly wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next time, innit? <laughs>